tonight, I will begin by introducing three people. This person may have seemed just like a cupbearer to the king of Persia, but really his ultimate loyalty was to the Most High God. His name was Nehemiah, and his desire was to serve only God. This man may just have seemed like another tent maker, traveling through minor Asia and Rome and other places. His name was Paul, but his ultimate loyalty was to God. This person may have seemed just like another private in the US Army, but his real job was to save lives and bring Jesus to his fellow comrades. His name was Desmond Doss, and his ultimate loyalty was to God. So my question for you tonight is, where is your ultimate loyalty? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity that we can learn more about your plans for our lives. I pray, Lord, that you may hide me, that the words that they hear and that the slides they see may be a result of your miracles. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit may come, that your angels may be up and down these aisles, Lord, that our hearts may be renewed in you tonight. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So as I begin, I have two disclaimers. Number one is you're probably wondering what this is. But I won't reveal it until later because it will make sense to you later. Number two is I'm preaching to myself. And so if all of you just left and I was left preaching to myself, my goal would be met. So I'm going to be preaching to myself. If you hear that I'm preaching to you, that's the Holy Spirit. So give credit where credit is due. So let's begin. Everybody knows this, right? Go ye therefore and teach all nation, nations. Say it with me. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And well, we know this one even better. And this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. But how do you fit in? Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. And so Sharon was born in Argentina in 96. And when I was born, my family on my mom's side, it was fifth generation Adventist, and my dad's side was second, Advent second generation. And so, of course, I grew up Adventist. Nothing much to expect, right? So, growing up, my life seemed pretty normal, except for the fact that my parents were always wanting to go to America or to Australia. Those were the two places they wanted to go. And obviously, where did we end up? In the States. These are some of the promises that my family claimed through their journey because Argentina was not easy. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. So, what am I talking to you tonight about? I'm talking to you about missionary work and the impact it's had in my life. So my parents were seeking to do what God wanted them to do and they felt that they were being led to the States. This one was another promise. And it shows, it is acquaintance that awakens sympathy, and sympathy is the spring of effective ministry. To awaken in the children and youth sympathy and the spirit of sacrifice for the suffering millions in the regions beyond, let them become acquainted with these lands and their people. And this is what I remember most about my childhood. I, we were just big into 3 Vienna and Hope Channel. We would always watch missionary programs, where the missionaries would go, what they were doing, and we would keep up tabs with these people. This became an all-consuming thing. When growing up, as a grown-up, I could never imagine myself at a nine-to-five job. That seems so boring. I didn't understand why people wanted to make a lot of money. So what? You're not taking it to heaven. So in my child's mind, like, I didn't understand why people wanted regular jobs. I wanted to be a missionary, so that's what I was going to be. So when we came to the States, that's all I could think of, whether it was going to be a doctor or I don't know, a veterinarian or a firefighter or something, anything. I went through stages of what I wanted to be. But whatever it was, I was going to be out in the jungle somewhere preaching for Jesus. So when my teenage years hit, there became a um, 
paramount influence in my life, which were my friends. And let me explain this to you after we read the quote. Let the world see that life with him is no failure. So these were all things that were going through my mind. Personal effort for others should be preceded by much secret prayer, for it requires great wisdom to understand the science of saving souls. Before communicating with men, commune with Christ. So growing up, this were like some of a batch of my friends, and they high school hit, and they were all going to go to this amazing Adventist school. And guess what? Sharon's parents said that school was not for Sharon. And so Sharon is left at home doing homeschool while all her friends are off at academy, and I felt like my life was a failure. Do you remember what the first quote said? It said, show that life with Jesus is no failure. And so I didn't understand why God kept me for homeschool for two years. But now looking back, I see why. Those years were the ones that I was closest to Jesus. My home became a sanctuary. That is the first time that I remember feeling Jesus close to me. Because my mom would have to tear me away from doing devotions because I had never understood a relationship with Jesus before. I had never seen a devotional life in the life of my family, my parents, my cousins. Nobody did this. And so when, I, when the first devotional landed in my hands, I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? But when I began, I realized that homeschool was a benefit in two ways. Number one, to get closer to Jesus, who I really had never known before. And number two, to spend time with my family because I didn't know how much more time I would have with them as I would realize later on in life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So this verse here has a great impact in my life because when, after two years of homeschool, I went to summer camp for like the seventh time in a row, and this was the theme verse. And up until that time, missionary work had just been theory. But something became changing. I mean, I had been baptized when I was like nine or something, but I didn't really understand why. I think maybe because my friends were getting baptized. But now I began to collect my Sabbath school lessons, and my sisters and I would take them door to door. We even got trouble for putting them in people's mailboxes. And <laughs> we would... Um, make bookmarks and give them to the, the, the clerks at Walmart. And so my mindset began to change that witnessing and mission work was something I had to start doing. It couldn't be just theory. And so when I read this verse, I realized that I couldn't be just like my friends. I couldn't be a regular person. I had to be different. And so it made sense to my family when I spontaneously decided to be rebaptized. Um, that week in summer camp by Pastor Brandon Westgate, which many of you know. Another obligation too often lightly regarded, one that to the youth awakened to the claims of Christ needs to be made plain, is the obligation of church relationship. The church is organized for service, and in a life of service to Christ, connection with the church is one of the first steps. Loyalty to Christ demands the faithful performance of church duties. This is an important part of one's training, and in church, imbued with the master's life, it would lead directly to effort for the world without. So at church, I was tired of being just a junior deaconess that did nothing but wash dishes after potluck. And so I wanted to do something more, and I discovered that the church had a library full of tracts and literature that nobody was using, and they were just disintegrating in the book, on the bookshelves. And so what I would do is I, every church, every Sabbath, I would spot out like the visitors and I'd be like, okay, bam, 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 four. So I would go run to the library and make like gift packets of like literature and Desire of Ages and different packets like that. And then I would make my job that they couldn't leave the church without a thank you packet. You know, thanks for coming. <laughs> and <laughs> so I remember this one particular time this blonde lady and her little boy came to church and they happened to disappear. And when someone disappears from Sharon, I was gonna go find them. So I ran out to the parking lot and there was a car leaving and I ran up to her, handed her the Desire of Ages and I said, ma'am, this book is for you. Thanks for coming today. Wish you could have stayed longer, whatever. And she stares at the book and she looks at me and she's like, where'd you get this? And I said, um, the church library. And she's like, I've been looking for this book for eight months. 
and I'm glad that you brought it to me right before I left. And like, I was just like, I mean, I was like 14 or so, and I, I guess that's the first divine appointment that I remember with my literature. <laughs> but I don't remember being really shocked. It was just kind of normal. But now that I think about it, I was like, wow, that was a miracle. And so my life of service to Christ, I realized that in loyalty, in mission work, I had to work for my church. And so I found this a blessing because it drew me closer to Jesus, the king of the church. James 4.4 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. My first exposure to music that I wouldn't consider what would be played here um, was in church school. And... Um, I would just listen to it and be really attractive and entertaining, of course, like all of you could agree. But when I was studying this, I didn't understand. I was like, that makes so much sense. Like, this music is not helping me in my mission work. It's not helping me in my relationship with Jesus. Like, no man can serve two masters. That is so logical. But why is it hard for me to understand today? And so I was willing to able, able to willingly give up the music because I didn't understand how it could help me. I found that it was worthless. That doesn't mean I still don't struggle with it. Disclaimer. But Jesus helps us all, right? The Lord will not accept cowards in his army. Those who begin their Christian life by being half and half will at least, will at last be found enlisted on the enemy's side, whatever may have been their first intentions. And to be an apostate, a traitor to the cause of God, is more serious than death, for it means the loss of eternal life. When I read this, it, was, it reminded me so much of my struggle with my friends because, honestly, all the friends that I had from church school, I don't see any of them today doing any mission work. They're all just getting regular jobs, getting regular boyfriends and girlfriends, getting regular mindsets for the rest of their life, that they're just going to be a regular person. I mean, that is not what we all want to be. We all want to fit in with the rest of the crowd, right? That's, is that what should, we should be pumping out from Adventist education? So that's what hit me hard, is that I didn't want to be a traitor to the cause of God. I had to be different from my friends. Let's go to Matthew 12.30. I just remembered I forgot to start my timer. That's grand. Matthew 12.30. And it says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. As I thought of myself as a grown-up person, I always remembered how I couldn't have a regular job, that it had to be something with mission work. And when I read this verse in homeschool years, I really wanted to be different, but half of me wanted to be like my friends. And so this verse said that I couldn't be half and half, because as the quote said, that would be a traitor. And I want to encourage all of you today that anybody who's going through this half and half business to choose God's side, because mission work is what he has in mind for us. And then we come to Lebanon. <coughs> so this is one of, one of the streets that we were dropped off canvassing. <coughs> And on this particular, <coughs> excuse me, day, I was um, canvassing this random person. He was actually a Lebanese from Australia. They had just moved back to help his country. And he pointed, after we were talking, like he was really interested in, in spiritual things. And he was so in love with the books that we had. And he turned to my friend and he said, I see Jesus in your eyes. And then he turned to me and guess what I was expecting? I was expecting, you know, he's gonna say, I see Jesus in your eyes. But he turns to me and he says, I see Mary in your eyes. <laughs> because it's a very Catholic place. And so when that happened to me, I was like, what? No, like, I, ca I can't be like thought that I believe in Mary. And even worse, this other time, 
the, uh, the man couldn't speak English, so he was like, oh, Messiah, he Christian. I was like, uh, yes, yes, because he was like super against the books. He was like, John, trying to figure him out if he was, I was like a Mormon Jehovah's Witness or something, because they have him over there too. And so he, he asked me, Messiah, he yes, uh, Evangelii, I was like, yes, um, that means uh, Protestant. And then he says, do you, in, in Arabic, do you believe in Jesus? And I was like, of course I do. And then he's like, do you believe in Adra? And I was like, Adra. Adventist Development and Relief Agency, of course I believe in Adra. <laughs> Later on I found out that Adra is Mary in Arabic. And I had admitted to believing in Mary. <laughs> but the man got a book, praise the Lord. <laughs> so, but I can assure you, I can assure you that if he had told me in straight English if I believed in Mary and I knew that I would have lost the sale, I would have said, no sir, I don't believe in Mary. How many of us can say just by people looking at us that we believe in Jesus? How many of us can say that the evidence of our lives points that we don't believe in idols and that we believe in Jesus? And that's what I wanted my life to be. I wanted people to know immediately from what they saw me doing, from what they saw me saying, from what they saw me living, that I was a Christian, an Adventist, willing to do mission work for God wherever. So that was one of the main lessons I learned from Lebanon. Now this is Oshkosh 2014 Pathfinder Campery. And this is where mission work hit my family like a bomb. Because growing up we had watched David Gates on TV and read his books and my dad had always wanted to be a uh, mission pilot but he actually did not go to college because he thought Jesus was coming so soon that he didn't have time to go to college. And his dad denied him an opportunity to study to be a helicopter. And so he had this intense desire to be a mission pilot for Jesus. And so when we went to Oshkosh, we realized that Pastor David Gates was there. And they went, made an appointment with him, and met with him and told him how they wanted to be missionaries. They also told him that because of our mission um, immigration status, that if they left, they would get a 10-year penalty of not being able to come back. And David Gates, he offered them on the spot to go to Bolivia. And they came back and told us, we're praying about going to Bolivia. I think we're going to accept this mission called to go Bolivia. That would be my mom, my dad, and my little, the youngest sister, Lara. And we were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, you told us this before. Last year we were going to move to Spain, and the year before we were going to move to Germany, and the year before we were going to go back to Argentina, so it doesn't make sense. There's no way that you guys are going to leave. But they made the decision to go, and four, six months later, five months later, they were in Bolivia. And so, I don't know how you would see this, but for me, it made me grow up real fast. Because now I was legal guardian of my second sister, and the only two of our family were in the States. But it helped me to remind me what mission work was like. A hundred years ago, that would have been the last time I would have said bye to my family, or hi, or whatever. But now, God has blessed us with technology and everything, but even still, it is a sacrifice. But not when I think of what Jesus did for me. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So these were all promises that my family claimed as a missionary family. On the top part, you can see them. They're moving from one house to another on the, the estate where the mission is. They have, uh, my mom's working as a physical therapist there and plans missionary trips to the jungle about three times a year where they take medicine by airplane and boats to the people up the river. And my dad is finishing his pilot's license, uh, about to be a mission pilot by God's grace. So that's his plane right there that he flies. He beat me to it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? When, right before my family left, about three months before they left, after they had made the decision to go, Obama came out with this act that he wanted to pass, that all the parents of Dreamers Act kids would get the ability to stay legally in the US. Karen and I were both Dreamers Act kids. 
And we knew that meant that our parents could stay here legally, which would we have, had been fighting for for 16 years with three different lawyers, lawyers, several grand each. And we realized that this was a big joke. Why would God give us this opportunity after my parents decide to go and leave? But my parents, time and time again, have shown me where their true loyalty is. And they decided to keep their promise to God to go to Bolivia. So they left. And we were just devastated, like, really, God? Like, you really pulled this card on us. And about three months after they had gone to Bolivia, Obama's act didn't pass. If they had stayed and re retracted, I guess, on their promise to God, they would have been left in the same situation, if not worse. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 2.4. And this is where I want you to put your thinking caps on, if you haven't already. 2 Timothy 2.4. because I believe that we are all in God's army if we choose to, if we choose to do so. Second Timothy 2.4 says, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So as I thought of my career, what I wanted to do, I didn't understand why I would be just a regular person, like I said before but I couldn't let myself get entangled with the things of this world, and you can't either. If you came here to this school to just get a job or just to get good grades for college, you're in the wrong school. Because Adventist education, from its very beginning, has designed to make missionaries. So I want to encourage you that no matter what degree God has in mind for you, it doesn't matter what it is, you can be a missionary. You are a soldier. And the reason I wanted to show this from this verse is because what do I look like with this coat on? Doctor, anything else? A chef. Okay. So in my choosing of a career, what was my main focus again? Missionary. So what I want to show you is that even though I may look like a lab technician, a doctor, pharmacist, or even a chef, what I truly am is a soldier for Christ. So that's what I represent with this uniform here. If I can get the lovely buttons off. So I want you all to remember that no matter what you choose, If it's God's will for you to be in that job, he's going to make a way for you to be a missionary in that job. So if I can just disentangle myself from the affairs of this world. <laughs> and this quote here is one of my favorites that has been lately. Because I want you to understand something that has been battling my mind for the longest. I don't understand why my friends have chosen random jobs that don't lead other people to Jesus or that don't lead themselves to Jesus. I want you to understand that there is nothing better in this world to do than to do mission service for the rest of your life. Mission service, ministry, when you think of ministry, it does not mean just theology students and just pastoring and just Bible working. If you change min, M-I-N, to M-E-N, ministry, whoever is a child of God on this earth is a mission field or a missionary. Which one are you going to be? So when you think of ministry, think of men who need to be reached in whatever faculty you can think of, in whatever department. And here's the quote. Multitudes will be called to a wider ministry. The whole world is opening to the gospel. Ethiopia is stretching out her hands unto God. From Japan and China and India, from the still darkened lands of our own continent. From every quarter of this world of ours comes the cry of sin-stricken hearts for a knowledge of the love of God. Millions upon millions have never so much as heard of God or of his love revealed in Christ. It is their right to receive this knowledge. 
They have an equal claim with us in the Savior's mercy, and it rests with us who have received the knowledge with our children to whom we may impart it to answer their cry. To every household and every school, to every parent, teacher, and child upon whom the, has shown the light of the gospel comes at this crisis the question put forth to Esther, which was what? Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Are you going to deny the opportunity God has given you to have your existence in the 21st century, to be the last generation? Why would you choose anything but to be a missionary for God? The question is for you today. How many of you realize there is a need for mission work and want to be a missionary for the rest of your lives? May I see you raise your hands? It does not mean that you have to go off in the jungle somewhere like it was my desire. It is my desire. It does not mean that you have to be a Bible worker for the rest of your life. It means that you are a child of God. Under whatever uniform you have, you have the uniform of Christ as his soldier. And I want you to remember tonight, if you forget anything else, that God has called you to be a soldier. And it is your duty to fulfill, fulfill the commands, fulfill the desires of your, our commander-in-chief. I also want to ask anybody here if you want to recommit your life to Jesus. Because I am guilty of treason. I have betrayed my commander-in-chief many a time, even today. And I want to recommit myself as I begin a new year of life. I want to recommit myself to being a true soldier for Jesus. And I want to ask you to stand up with me to, uh, for closing prayer if you also desire to recommit your life to Jesus today. Because no matter where God leads you in college or anywhere else, postgrad, whatever, you must remember your true calling and your true job and your ultimate loyalty. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for helping me to preach to myself, for reminding me of how you've helped in the past, Lord, because we have nothing to fear for the future, except as, um, as we forget the way you've led us in the past and your teaching in our past history. And I pray, Father, that you may help us and remind us of the stand we are taking tonight, that you may help us to realize, Lord, of our guilt of treason, that you may help us to realize our sin, because without sin there would be no need for a savior. So I pray, Lord, that you may help us to realize how much we need you. I ask, Lord, Commander-in-Chief, that you may give us our first commands tonight and always, and that we may be ever willing to follow you wherever you call us, as missionaries, missionaries forever. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.